Assalamualaikum everyone. Welcome back after a short break. I hope you all enjoyed the poster session. Uh, there were some pretty informative and uh, well-designed posters by the presenters. So let's start with this session. I am Sabahuddin Ahmed, a physics undergraduate final year student at School of Natural Sciences, NUST, Pakistan. And I will be moderating today's discussion session. Uh, the format for the discussion is pretty simple. It's an open discussion. And if you have any question, all you need to do is raise your hand and we will give you the option to ask your question directly from our guests. Uh, while you get ready, let me introduce our panel of guests. Okay, so we have with us now Dr. Peter Rohde from Australia, whom by now most Hello, of you know as... Hi, Dr. Peter. Okay, so Dr. Peter Rohde from Australia, whom by now most of you know as our co-organizer of this conference. For those of you who have just, just joined us, Dr. Peter is a senior lecturer and ARC Future Fellow at University of Technology, Sydney, who is working in almost all things quantum. He's also a member of Heron Institute of, for Theoretical Physics. So welcome, Dr. Peter. Uh, we also have with us... Uh, Okay, so uh, we also have some national guests here, uh, Dr. Adam Zaman, an assistant professor in the physics department at Lahore University of Management Sciences, and is currently working in quantum optics and quantum information. So welcome, Dr. Adam. Furthermore, we also have Dr. Muhammad Faryad, an assistant professor of physics at Lahore University of Management Sciences. He obtained his MSc in 2006 and MPhil in electronics in 2008 from the Kaidi Azam University and his PhD in engineering science and mechanics from the Pennsylvania State University in 2012. Most of his past research has focused on com computational electromagnetics, but he has been learning quantum computing for the last couple of years. So welcome Dr. Fayyad. So we have a very diverse panel for sure. And I hope the audience is ready to ask their questions. Let me just move towards the chat. So um, let me uh, see. I may see if someone has raised their hand for the question. Mm. Uh, okay. Well, I guess the people are still preparing to ask questions. So I can start with a, a question of mine. Oh, okay. So, I mean, uh, quantum computing and information, it's a relatively new field. And, uh, you know, it's an interest in this particular field is increasing day by day. Uh, I mean, this, this conference, the whole purpose of this conference is also to, you know, promote interest and that new people can develop interest in quantum computing. Uh, usually people from different other fields change their careers and then move towards quantum. So I would like to, I ask my first question from Dr. Peter. Uh, I hope he's there. Yeah, you're okay. Yeah. Okay, so Dr. Peter, I came to know that you are an electrical engineer. Uh, you were uh, an electrical engineer and then you moved towards the quantum realm, right? That's right. So um, I originally studied uh, electrical engineering and computer systems engineering because that was always my, my childhood interest. When, when I was a kid, quantum computing didn't exist, at least uh, not as a major field of research. Um, but then it was fairly easy to transition into quantum computing uh, for a PhD because these are highly transferable skills. And th this is something that often comes up with, with students asking me, you know, how do I prepare for a career in, in, in quantum technology or quantum computing? Um, uh, am I choosing the right subjects and uh, have I chosen the right thing? And um, am I locked out of this career because I, I chose the wrong discipline? Uh, the answer is no. Uh, if you have a strong background in mathematics and computer science and physics, these are all highly transferable skills. And quantum computing sort of sits at the intersection. If you draw the Venn diagram, it sits, the, it sits at the intersection of computer science and mathematics and physics. Uh, and so as long as you have the, so the strong STEM background, you can really move into this field very, very easily. Right, right. Perfect. So, I mean, obviously, the uh, people do really have this question, as you may ask it. Uh, it's, a, it's a basic question that every person who is, uh, you know, joining this field as uh, a beginner, they usually have this question. So, uh, 
are you uh, i mean were can you highlight some uh, efficient or good resources for the beginners who are just joining this particular quantum computing field yeah so i mean th these days uh the the way to approach it is can be much more sh streamlined and shortcutted than what i did uh because now you can get dedicated degrees in quantum computing or at least P phd's and and now undergraduate degrees even in some places um but but really it comes down to get, getting experience with uh, quantum physics and quantum mechanics as early as possible in your studies uh and familiarity uh, with mathematics and uh, and engineering principles as much as possible and and as long as you're just generally guided in that direction and you've got some grasp of quantum physics along the way the rest you, you sort of pick it up like it's such a big field that there's no single subject that, that will prepare you for everything. It's such an enormous field now that even the absolute experts in the field don't understand every single individual subfield and all the nuances. Um, just in the same way that if you're an engineer, you don't know everything about engineering. You specialize in one particular type of engineering. But now engineering is so big that it's one particular subtype of a subtype of engineering that people specialize in. So uh, my advice is guide yourself according to your interests as you go. Start by making sure that you're familiar with the basics of things like quantum computing and quantum physics. And as you go and you start reading papers, you, you figure out what aspects of it really appeal to you and what are interesting to you and then you start carving out your own little niche area and, and that's really what leads to a research career is finding something really that's of interest to you that other people may not have thought so much about that's how you find a, a new niche in the market great great yeah definitely it, it all at the end of the day depends on uh, our own particular interest and obviously as you mentioned Specifically, that there are uh, some resources, and obviously, there are now proper degree programs uh, on quantum computing. So, right, well, we also have Dr. Faryad here uh, from LUMS. So, I'm here. yeah, uh, Dr. Faryad, I have the same question for you as well. Uh, uh, you, you are all also. Uh, just start, I mean, as I mentioned, your bio as well in at the start that you have just started uh, learning quantum computing and you have also transferred your career towards quantum computing. So, what's your experience? I mean, can you uh, share uh, any challenges that you faced while transitioning to this quantum uh, world? Uh, thank you very much. So. Uh... Yes, as you mentioned that uh, uh, my earlier work uh, was in computational physics, but it was mostly uh, classical computation. And uh, a couple of years ago, I uh, uh, began to get interested in uh, learning quantum computing. And uh, uh, as far as uh, uh, the available resources are concerned, I think uh, there is, uh, you know, uh, a wide variety uh, of resources that are now available on the web. Uh, uh, thankfully, the uh, computing community in general and uh, also the quantum computing and information community uh, is mostly, you know, uh, uh, it is very helpful to everybody else around and uh, almost everybody posts their lecture notes, videos and uh, course, everything online so that other people uh, can learn from them. And also many companies, especially IBM, uh, they have, uh, you know, made available a lot of instructional materials uh, on the web that students can start uh, uh, from there. Like there is a Qiskit uh, textbook online that explains the algorithms and also their implementation that students can start, you know, from almost basic and uh, in sort of a self-guided way, uh, they can uh, go on learning. Uh, and that's actually how I also mostly started out, even though uh, my first and the uh, only course in quantum physics that I ever took as a student was actually from Dr. Franz Seff, who was uh, one of the speaker earlier today. And, uh, but since then, uh, uh, I, you know, have been working in other areas, but when I came back, uh, of course, the best point to start is always learning uh, quantum physics. If you are, you know, already familiar with the classical computing. 
If you're not familiar with classical computing, then perhaps uh, learning quantum physics and a little bit of computer science in parallel would be helpful on this journey. And as far as the challenges are concerned, I think particularly for people and students in Pakistan, the major challenge is uh, uh, a very small community of people who are working uh, in quantum computing, especially. There are a lot of people who work in quantum optics in Pakistan and uh, people can uh, talk to them and discuss with them uh, problems and ideas so that they can deepen their own understanding and you know uh, get to know of problems in it. But quantum computing uh, is essentially an area which is uh, you know very scarce in Pakistan. There are only few people who are working in quantum computing. So that's one challenge that I face uh, you know when I started that uh, there's almost nobody uh, except for a few people that I can talk to about different quantum algorithms if I have some trouble, okay. Uh, how, what's the logic of that algorithm or how it's work, working or if I have some trouble at some implementation point. So, uh, but hopefully when more and more students uh, learn this and uh, come into this area, there will be more and more people who uh, we can interact with. Uh, and that was especially, you know, uh, felt during the last couple of years because of COVID that we couldn't travel internationally. And uh, uh, th that was one challenge that I felt. But hopefully with the COVID gone, uh, uh, people would be able to travel internationally to, to discuss other people. And if I see chat uh, in the chat, uh, there's somebody who has asked a question about uh, practical lab for quantum computing. So uh, the development of quantum computers actually, uh, which has been benchmarked and uh, have qubits uh, with a very low error uh, is a very highly challenging and uh, uh, field and it requires a lot of investment. So unfortunately, we don't have any practical quantum computer in Pakistan uh, that uh, people can you know, access and uh, 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 simulate their programs on. But uh, thankfully, IBM's uh, quantum computers are available through cloud to everybody in the world. So students can access uh, uh, quantum computers of IBM and uh, uh, simulate their programs on those computers. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Fayyad, for uh, sharing your experience and uh, as well as answering the question. So we have uh, a member, an audience member here who's ready to ask their question. Uh, Mariam Essen. Mariam, uh, you can ask your question now. Thank you, Salaudi. So my question is from Dr. Adam and uh, Dr. Fayyad. So uh, you guys have worked in theory in Pakistan and abroad as well. So as you've already established, that is definitely um, a deficiency of uh, experimental apparatus for quantum computing in Pakistan. But, you know, when we talk about the theoretical side of quantum uh, information or quantum computation, uh, is that also difficult to implement in Pakistan? Like, are, are there any, because, you know, there's no expensive or uh, big apparatus required. So uh, is there a future for it in Pakistan? anytime soon okay so i would let, let adam talk first because i was just talking earlier okay so yeah i mean there is there is a bit of a problem as as Faryad said that they're, they're even in quantum information and, and they're uh, the, who, who work in in a similar area as you uh, but I think that's that's natural given the the, the, the situation that we have that uh, they are uh, we are a bit behind in science eh? but that's how things start. I mean these are still early days um, as far as the, the quantum revolution is concerned and and, and Pakistan being a third world country it's just expected that that we'll be like five steps behind but 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 it's it's extremely important that we, that we don't, you know, uh, let the opportunity pass us by, and and, and uh, we do join the quantum revolution, uh, which which I I personally think will come sooner or later, and uh, we and we have to take part in it essentially. So uh, so yeah, it it is a struggle occasionally, but but uh, you get by. There is a future as well. I mean, if if the quantum revolution does really take off. Um, then yes, your skills will be in demand. It's it's one of those things that that that, that uh, the the supply is not too big either currently. <laughs> okay. 
Okay, so uh, if I may also take a shot uh, at it. So I think this is a valid concern uh, of students who are planning to join this area that uh, if they, you know, put a lot of effort and time into it, uh, is it worth it if, uh, you know, their long-term plan is to stay in Pakistan? And I personally believe uh, that it's definitely worth it. And uh, I think for those people who would be joining uh, this area right now, it's probably going to be even better because there will be sort of leaders uh, in this area in Pakistan. And uh, uh, what we need to do is to realize that uh, quantum technologies is now a very big area. And I'm, I'm sure Peter can also, you know, uh, say something about this. For example, it encompasses uh, quantum computing. So that's only one part. So for that, you need a quantum computer. But hopefully, uh, in, in uh, maybe a few years, even if we are not able to make our own quantum computer, we might be able to get a quantum computer, uh, you know, from uh, companies who are making and they would be selling. So we need an expertise uh, in, in our country where people know how to operate such a, a, a computer and how to, you know, get advantage from this. So even in quantum computing side, uh, there's going to be uh, a huge opportunity for those people who are ready to uh, work with these machines. But that's only one part. And the other part is the uh, information side. So, the, uh, uh, sorry, the uh, communication side. So communication is being affected in two ways due to quantum revolution. One is, of course, a new regime of uh, uh, quantum uh, communication, which you can call quantum communication, where we are, you know, sending uh, entangled photons and uh, uh, the information encoded to them. So we need, you know, quantum information uh, tools uh, to implement that. And uh, uh, hopefully uh, uh, that side, when, you know, uh, it's implemented worldwide, it would be implemented here as well. But then there's another side to communication. Even being in the classical domain, now uh, people are trying to discover post-quantum cryptographic techniques that, that are immune to quantum attacks. So even within the classical world, a lot of work is being done to come up with new protocols that people cannot, you know, break even when they have access to uh, a quantum computer. For example, our speaker in the morning, uh, uh, she was telling us that uh, some people are now already, you know, holding up all the data that they can get their hands on in the world. And they're storing it with themselves because they, uh, they are thinking that maybe in five to 10 years, if they have a quantum computer that can decrypt it, they will then be able to, you know, know what's going on right now. So that's why even without quantum computer, there is a lot of work that is being done on post-quantum protocols. And then there is a third area, which is, you know, quantum metrology. So uh, there's a considerable amount of work which is being done uh, in building uh, very highly sensitive sensors to measure, let's say, magnetic field, gravitational field, uh, uh, clocks, and et cetera. So uh, that area is also, you know, uh, rapidly catching on. And that's, you know, independent of uh, what's happening in quantum, you know, computer side. So there are uh, many areas uh, and uh, uh, my personal guess is that say that even uh, worst fears regarding quantum computers come true, that uh, people are not able to scale quantum computer. These other areas are definitely going to, uh, you know, mature, especially the communication and metrology side. And uh, there's going to be a lot of scope uh, of working in those areas anywhere in the world, not just in Pakistan. Yeah, just, uh, just to add to that. Uh, oh, yeah, sorry. Go ahead. Peter. Oh, I was going to uh, come back to the question uh, that was posted in the chat about what's the future in Pakistan for someone who has these skills. Um, this is a really important question. Um, and it has a lot of parallels to Australia that I, I thought I'd share with you. Um, it, it's very clear that Pakistan has the intellectual capital. We can certainly see that from, from this conference that the, Pakistan has an enormously, um, uh, uh, an enormous intellectual capital, fantastic students, great academic institutions. But essentially all of this research is taking place in the academic institutions. But quantum computing is now reaching a point where it's shifting away from academia and into the private sector. And that's, that's a transition that's really only just begun to happen in the last few years. And just recently, we've seen a number of big private sector quantum computing companies being floated on the stock exchange, raising billions of dollars in private equity. Um, that's the transition that's happening now. 
And uh, Pakistan, to my knowledge, doesn't have any local industry in this field. Uh, and it stresses the importance that that start taking place. And that's something that will require uh, a lot of uh, uh, political decision making. It'll require support at the political level to encourage a homegrown quantum industry. But that is going to be absolutely essential because the last thing you want is to train all of these brilliant, bright minds and then they all get up and leave because, uh, because there are uh, better opportunities somewhere else. And this is exactly what happened in Australia. Um, if you look at lot, who lots of the influential people in quantum computing are, early on, Australia was disproportionately influential in this field. Michael Nielsen, who wrote the standard text that you're all familiar with, he was Australian, a colleague of mine in Brisbane. Um, the, the CEO and well, the two co-founders of uh, SciQuantum now has a, a market capitalization of several billion dollars in the United States. Both Australians, Terry Rudolph and Jeremy O'Brien, both colleagues of mine in Australia. Uh, Christian Weedbrook, who founded Xanadu in Canada and has raised several hundred million dollars now. He was an Australian. He did his PhD with me. They've all gone overseas. They didn't stay in Australia. We could have had that industry in Australia, but they all left to go overseas because that's where the fields were brighter. So why did that happen? Well, it's because of access to capital, but more importantly, political will and a regulatory framework that creates and fosters a good economic climate for private sector investment. And that's where Australia lost its, uh, lost its gain. And all, all we had this, suffered this massive brain drain of all these brilliant people who invented all of these incredible things and then took it all overseas. And that's where the money is being made. Um, I'd like to encourage Pakistan not to make the same mistake that we made, because now's, now's the turning point in the market where all the money is flowing into the private sector. And we don't want to all become clients whereby we train bright people and then they move overseas. I mean, I don't want to discourage people from going overseas. People should be free to do what they want, but they should be incentivized uh, to stay in their own countries by political will and a regulatory framework that encourages uh, investment and, uh, and evolution of the industry in the homegrown country. And I, and I hope that that's what will happen in Pakistan. I hope that our own government here in Australia will increase its commitment so that we don't keep making the same mistake. But, uh, but that, that's really the decision that has to be made at the much higher level at this point in time is how do we retain and capitalise off all of this intellectual capital that we have? And Pakistan clearly has an enormous amount of it. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Peter. Uh, Dr. Adam, uh, do you have to comment? Yeah. Anything? Or you were going to say something? No, I, 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 was, I, was, I was trying to address previously the, the concern raised that, that, that when students to think about, the, about these quantum technologies, that is, right, is a right. quantum computer. And yes, it is true that, that, that a quantum computer currently at least is, is pretty far away. So, for example, to, to really practically apply Shor's algorithm to so that you know you really get a benefit for using quantum versus classical you're still far away from that but all these other quantum technologies uh, in particular quantum metrology uh, for example for quantum sensing they are not that expensive uh, you get there's still uh, some theoretical work there's a lot of theoretical work to be done there's a lot of experimental work to be done and even experimentally, they're not that expensive. Even at LUMS, for example, we, we are doing some quantum sensing experiments. The vacancy centers. So right. those areas, even in those areas, we can still do contribute towards, you can still do, do be part of this quantum revolution. It doesn't, so my thing is that students focus way too much on the quantum computer and they forget that there's all these other uh, applications of that and look even classically if you think about it they, they, recently there have been many classical algorithms which people didn't know before and if you actually ask the guys who came up with those classical computing algorithms that how did you think about doing this they actually will tell you that okay that, that they looked at a similar at the corresponding quantum algorithm which was actually outperforming the classical algorithm and they actually use that as an inspiration 
to actually improve on the existing best classical algorithm so even if if nothing if you if even if nothing comes out of 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 looking at quantum algorithms they can actually be used to actually improve the classical performance right right obviously i, I guess the local opportunities uh, will definitely be an uh, uh, an increased step uh, towards attracting you know local uh, interested applicants to in towards quantum computing so uh we also have another guest with us uh, who is a part of our panel um dr mark wilde i hope i have pronounced your name right so dr mark wilde and is an associate professor in the department of physics and astronomy and the center for computation and Te technology at the louisiana state university usa he will be joining cornell university soon and he is a recipient of multiple awards such as career development award from the us national science foundation and many more and his current research interests are in quantum shannon theory quantum optical com communication quantum computational complexity theory and quantum error correction so welcome dr mark to this session hello uh, thanks for the nice introduction and nice oh, to meet you Okay. Okay. Uh, welcome, welcome, Dr. Mark. Okay. So, uh, Dr. Mark, as you, uh, as other speakers and guests have also mentioned, and uh, Dr. Peter also mentioned the situation in Australia. So, how is the situation in USA? Is uh, is their brain drain or the investment by the government good enough for uh, the local uh, residents of US or the international applicants as well in terms of quantum computing and quantum information? Well, uh, in the U.S., there, we're kind of in a situation where there's there's too much funding <laughs> available <laughs> in this field. Um, you know, um, the, the Quantum National Initiative was passed in December uh, 2018, I believe it was, and then that authorized a uh, billion dollars for for the field, and um, so many places like. Uh, government labs there are these quantum science centers that have been established for department of energy and that established lots of funding for um you know uh, national laboratories and some universities so um for example los alamos national lab they they have lots of funding um, we have sent students over there to conduct research in quantum computing, they're very interested in uh, variational quantum algorithms um, and, and seeing what can be done on near-term quantum computers. They also have specialized, uh, they have access to specialized quantum computers from IBM uh, and companies like Rigetti that are not um, readily available elsewhere. Um, yeah, so there's, there's, I would, definitely say there's not a uh, brain drain there, there's brain drain from other places into the u.s which has kind of been a common thing in, in science um yeah so i mean the national science foundation has lots of funding available department of energy has <clears throat> lots of funding available we've even had situations where like um National Science Foundation, I've been able to apply for supplements to the grants that I have with them for, you know, get, uh, testing out what can be done with current quantum computers. Uh, they have travel grants available. So, yeah, um, we're, the field is in a um, booming situation at the moment. There's, there's a fear that if promises are not kept, if promises are not um, uh, you know, kept, then the funding might start retracting, but we're, th that doesn't appear to be in sight at the moment. You know, um, as Peter was saying, there, there are companies really um, starting up uh, and um, th they're getting a lot of investment. You know, recently there was a, a company, uh, IonQ, started by Christopher Monroe and Young Sung Kim of uh, Duke University. And um, 
they, they went public on the New York Stock Exchange. You know, there is some picture of them at, at Wall Street uh, <laughs> when their company was going public. So, yeah. Um, I see there's a question in the chat box that I could address. Uh, there was a question about quantum computing and quantum information theory. Would you like me to address that? Yeah, definitely, definitely. I was just yeah. To... So um, this is an interesting question. You know, um, definitely computing and communication intersect. Like any quantum compu quantum communication device will make use of a non-trivial amount of quantum. Uh, computing and um, vice versa. But it is worthwhile to uh, separate these topics out into different courses. Uh, I've been doing that at LSU for approximately the past decade. So right now I'm actually teaching a course on quantum information. If people are interested, you go to, I have a website, markwilding.com slash teaching. You can find it there. So in the quantum information course, so indeed for both courses, you need to uh, spend about a month building up backgrounds in quantum mechanics, but it's typically easier to do so for a quantum computing course, because usually what you do in a quantum computing course is you stick to uh, pure states, unitary evolution, projective measurements, but in a quantum information course, you go into density operators. Uh, so mixed states, uh, noisy evolution, quantum channels, and um, generalized measurements. So the, the background ends up being a bit deeper in quantum information. And typically it's, it's more challenging to understand the concept of a density operator in a quantum channel. Um, so the, the, the introductory parts of the courses diverge. And then in a quantum information course, your goal, or at least the goal that I've had, is typically to get to communication theory. So the quantum generalization of what Shannon did many years ago. You know, we're interested in questions like, uh, what are the fundamental limits of data compression? What are the fundamental limits of communication? And so to address those questions, um, we need concepts like entropy and mutual information. This will actually be the, related to the content of my talk today. I'm gonna to give a broad overview of quantum Shannon theory. And in quantum computing, your goal is to get to, uh, and, and the, the questions for the courses are fundam fundamentally different, right? So for computation, the goal is what are the fundamental limits of computation for communication, what are the fundamental limits of communication? So in a quantum computing course, typically you're focusing on algorithms, you know, and how do you, how do you implement algorithms? You know, in a communication course, you assume, or at least an information theory course, you assume that local computation is available for free and you don't count like the complexity to implement the encoding and decoding algorithms. Whereas in a quantum computing course, that's precisely what you're interested in. Like what is the complexity of implementing an algorithm? And then you start focusing on algorithms like um, Shor's algorithm, Grover's algorithm. Um, I'm gonna be teaching a quantum computing course in the spring. And I have thoughts of revamping the course to incorporate recent insights. There's a very powerful algorithm that's come out called the uh, quantum singular value transformation algorithm. This is really something that I think everyone in quantum computing should be learning about. Um, what it allows for is a method. Um, if you have a way of encoding a matrix as a, uh, a, a block matrix within a unitary, then this algorithm allows for performing an arbitrary function of that matrix. Um, it, it allows for doing a transformation of that unitary such that the resulting unitary you've realized has a function applied to this uh, block encoded matrix. 
And there was recently a kind of review of this article that came out from Isaac Chuang and his group members. Of course, Isaac Chuang is the one who wrote the famous book, Nielsen and Chuang, that uh, Peter mentioned. So um, they provide a review of this algorithm. They call it a grand unification of quantum algorithms. So, um, you know, many algorithms such as Grover's, Shor's, Hamiltonian simulation, um, quantum algorithms for semi-definite programming and optimization can be understood as special cases of this algorithm. You know, many of the algorithms that are used for quantum machine learning uh, are, are based on uh, speed ups that are available by um, for, for basic linear algebra routines. And this algorithm um, captures that in, in this uh, basic framework. So um, anyway, I'm starting to digress a bit from the question, but um, indeed, I think that's an extremely important algorithm to learn about. I don't know if anyone will be talking about that at this conference. Uh, thank, you. thank you, Dr. Mark, for your, uh, giving the answer for that question. Okay, so we have uh, some more audience members uh, who are ready to ask their questions. So Yagana, you can ask your question. You're there, Yagana. Okay, I guess we can move towards the next. We, we can pretend we know what the question is and answer it. Oh, she can't unmute herself. Uh, well, I guess we have given her access to. Unmute. Oh, now it's now it's good. Okay, go ahead. Thank you, so much, Martin. I'm I have been unmuted now. Okay, so my question is from both the national and the international panelists. That as we know that uh, one of the applications of quantum information computation is in the security sector, the intelligence or security sector. So as Pakistanis, uh, uh, is it something of concern to us that because of our nationality, it can be, uh, we might be deprived of opportunities internationally in this very specific uh, sector? That's a, um, a legitimate concern uh, because um, I know that in Australia, and I, I think it's probably similar in the United States, Mark can probably comment on that. In Australia, we have uh, defense export control legislation, and that broadly encompasses uh, quantum technologies now. And it's getting tighter and tighter. And I know that specifically when it comes to Iran, not Pakistan, but Iran, it's extremely difficult in Australia to, uh, to collaborate with uh, Iranian collaborators or bring in Iranian students because it con conflicts with these uh, various uh, defense export laws that we have in place, which are so complex that you can't understand it. But it, it's so complex that you can't understand it and therefore you can't navigate it and it becomes uh, so much of a burden to try and navigate it that it ends up not being worth it. So it creates a regulatory barrier so huge that it's uh, insurmountable. It, it's a legitimate concern that in some jurisdictions, uh, nationality will play a role because this technology is a dual use technology uh, and, and can be used for all sorts of purposes. Uh, but that's not a reason to feel excluded from the sector altogether. Uh, because even if there aren't opportunities in, in one jurisdiction, uh, you can always do research uh, and, and publish uh, in, in international journals the way we all do. Uh, you can you can always go to a jurisdiction where you are able to collaborate freely. It's not as though every country has the same uh, defence export laws. And these things vary enormously. They will change over time. But yes, it's something that you need to keep an eye on. But it's not a reason to give up hope because, um, because certainly people from every nation very successfully contribute to the research in this field. Yeah, so I'll, I'll comment on that as well from the perspective of the U.S. If your interest 
uh, like like mine is to do academic research, then there's certainly not a problem um, with with opportunities at universities in the U.S. And there's certainly many rich and interesting theoretical questions still available to address in our field. It's not like everything has become entirely commercial and there's nothing left to do from an academic perspective. So, you know, if, if your goal is to do research in the field, um, if you're excited about ideas like teleportation, you know, extensions of teleportation, uh, quantum algorithms, um, even quantum key distribution, there's, there, there are many opportunities available at universities. Um, when you, when you start, when your goal, if your goal shifts to being to work for a U.S. government lab like uh, Los Alamos, then it becomes more difficult, um, you know, because <clears throat> the, those, uh, those places do have more security concerns, you know, and if you, if you, you know, um, I, I think it would, I mean, I've, I've never attempted, but like, suppose that you wanted to work in the US intelligence community on quantum computing, then I, that would probably be pretty challenging. <laughs> you know, if you're, if you're coming from Pakistan, just due to the various uh, political constraints. But um, I, I'm not, I cannot comment on how it is with companies, but, um, Presumably, there's there's not a, a problem, you know. Um, uh, I, I and like the companies, they're getting their funding from the private sector. Um, I, I think some companies, like the bigger companies, like IBM and Google, you know, possibly they're getting funding from uh, intelligence community and and defense community, but I, I don't really know. Um, you know, in Canada, there are also many opportunities. So if you're, you know, half Iranian, then there would be uh, less trouble uh, getting into um, th this kind of work in, in Canada, you know. Um, but, you know, in the US, there are many Iranian uh, students. Like when I was, I did my PhD at the University of Southern California a decade, over a decade ago. And there were several students uh, from Iran, you know, who were who were in the program. And actually, one of them, um, Ali Reza Shabani, uh, he he graduated under Daniel Lidar, and now he works for Cisco. You know, he's heading up the the quantum group there. They're trying to do networking. So, you know, I, I think the the message is that there's not a uh, there's not a problem if you want to do work in a university environment and um, if you if you wanted to work in a company also after that you know so um, yeah I don't know if you want to add anything to that Peter yeah I think um, ultimately these things are highly dynamic and whatever we say today is probably not necessarily going to be the case in a year's time. Uh, but, but actually, building on what, what you were saying, Mark, uh, in Australia, it is now the case that these uh, kinds of laws do affect private companies. I don't know the full details of it, but I know that there was quite a kerfuffle about it when um, the very limited number of quantum startups in Australia were very concerned by some of the new legislation's potential impact on their ability to attract uh, foreign capital and uh, foreign intellectual uh, manpower because, uh, uh, because it, it was just so tightly, uh, tightly worded and extremely broad uh, and also unreliable in the sense that you know that it's going to change over the years. So I, th I think maybe the, the uncertainty risk is, is part of the big problem. Yeah. I'll add to this that in the U.S., uh, most of the concern is actually about China, you know, <laughs> with regards to quantum technology. I, I have not heard that there's concern about uh, Pakistan or India or Russia. Most of the concern is about China because China has a uh, they've, they've made tremendous achievements in this field. 
in quantum key distribution, and now we're seeing it in quantum computing also. Um, so, you know, that's that's where most of the concern is. I, I mean, this this is true from a geostrategic perspective. Obviously, China is the is the big player uh, in terms of competing with the West. At the same time, it's um, such a big power that it's hopeless to try and uh, push back against their influence. So instead, these legislations that we have, they tend to um, to, to more target the, the the smaller players like Iran, for example, which has always uh, not been on friendly friendly terms with the Australian government. I, d- I don't know why they would perceive Iran as a risk from a quantum computing perspective. It, you know compared to China, it obviously doesn't make sense, but, yeah. but politics often doesn't, right? Politics yeah. isn't sensible. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Peter. Thank you, Dr. Mark, for giving such a detailed answer on, the, on this issue. Okay, so we have another uh, member from the audience who is ready to ask their question. So, Zain, uh, you can ask your question now. Uh, well, hello. I hope I'm audible. Yes. yes uh, yeah, sure. my question is to the whole uh, panel. Uh, there's a very common fear among the common folk that uh, achieving quantum supremacy would render all the existing encryption uh, protocols, all the ex- uh, existing encryption render, uh, it will render them useless. So uh, I would like to ask if a st- if a country or a state, if or or a company for uh, for that matter achieves quantum supremacy, how valid are their fears? Given, uh, like uh, I, I guess Doctor uh, Doctor Fayyad mentioned earlier that people are working on post quantum protocols. In the uh, event where they haven't been properly, you know, made, do you think that the fears of the common folk are very valid here? Um, so my, my view on the whole risk to cryptography presented by quantum computing is, uh, maybe a little bit more measured than some of the headlines you see in the newspapers where it's presented as the moment that someone has a quantum computer, they're going to crack all of the public key cryptography and, uh, and then everything's ruined. Well, it's not that simple, even if we did have a large scale quantum computer, it's not as though it can spontaneously just crack a code. It still takes a significant execution time. um, And you you don't just click your finger and all of a sudden every code is broken. Um, That technology would be used in a very targeted way to crack the most high priority things from the perspective of the person doing the cracking. And, And it simply isn't the case that you can just uh, overnight suddenly undo all of the encryption that it's in place. Um, secondly, lots of encryption um, is only valid for a short amount of time. If you want to do a bank transaction, you exchange a session key, it, it only has a lifetime that lasts for however many seconds, and then and then you discard those keys anyway, and they're not valid anymore when your transaction is finished. So it also depends on the time sensitivity of, um, of what it is that you're encrypting. Um, so there is a lot more to it than, than just the moment that someone has a large scale quantum computer, then everything is compromised. That, that it's not as simple as that. Yeah, and to, to add what, to what Peter said, you know, these quantum supremacy experiments, um, you, you can consider them just to be initial demonstrations of, uh, of what, of the power of quantum computing, but you're probably aware that they don't solve any problem that's known to be useful. They just solve these like sampling problems that were constructed for the specific purpose of demonstrating a quantum advantage over uh, classical computing. So, you know, those initial demonstrations, uh, Google was 2019, is that right? Has it been two years? <laughs> uh, whatever, you know. In the the recent, what's that? In, in that ballpark. Yeah. So, um, you know, I think we're still, 
really far away from having a fault tolerant quantum computer that can crack encryption algorithms. However, there are promises being made. You know, you can read about the company Psy Quantum. Um, they are currently I read like valued at three billion U.S. dollars, <laughs> and they have promised um, to to have over a million qubits like in the next two years. Um, so that's very interesting <laughs> to see whether this will actually happen. Um, if they can accomplish that, then then um, quantum computing that can crack encryption codes might be here faster than we can uh, think about. Um, but I, I'm not sure, you know, I'm, I'm not involved in that company in any way, so I'm not sure whether they'll live up to that promise. At the very least, uh, companies like IBM and Google are, are much farther away from having fault tolerant quantum computers. I believe that their promises are in the next year and two years to have a thousand qubits that are working somewhat decently, you know, so it's a bit more measured what they're hoping to accomplish. Um, uh, and then, of course, you know, the concern about, uh, to follow up on what Peter was saying, the concern about uh, breaking all encryption. I will say that in the US, there's NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technology. To my disappointment and other people's disappointment in, in quantum information, including the late Professor Jonathan Dowling, who was my colleague at LSU, NIST has moved, has decided to go in the direction of post-quantum cryptography to secure the existing uh, uh, encryption. And um, they, they chose that over quantum key distribution. So that was honestly a bit of a bummer for me because uh, I've been working in quantum key distribution, uh, the theory of it since around 2013, since around- but, but, but Have you got public key quantum key distribution yet? Public key cryptography using QKD? That, that's right. the reason. That's a, that's a good point. And that's, that's, that's the point. It's just, um, they considered it to, you can read their report about it. They considered it to be more difficult and expensive to implement is where, you know, uh, post quantum cryptography is a, a, you know, potential solution. You know, if the, if it can be immune to all kinds of quantum attacks. So um, anyway, you know, I, I think, my, my th I, I think there's not a concern for uh, existing crypto systems for at least the next uh, five to 10 years. But, you know, companies are starting to plan um, for, for quantum attacks. You know, Goldman Sachs in the, in the US, they, they now have a quantum computing team is what I've heard. I don't know the people, you know, but various financial companies are trying to build up expertise in this area to prepare for the quantum future. I mean, I mean mind you, finance is a perfect example of where um, five to 10 or 20 year timescales do matter because yeah. financial assets can be valued according to that forward price. Mm -hmm. And if you know that a contract is valid in 10 years time, then technically it doesn't have any value now if, it, if it's compromised before it's met maturity. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Peter. Thank you, Dr. Mark. Okay, so we have some more questions in the chat section. Uh, I'm going to read them. So we have a question from Hamna Aslam. Uh, she has mentioned, she has asked that most of the projects happening right now are collaborative in nature, but do you see the power and production of quantum applications concentrating in the hands of a few companies in the future? And what do you think can be done to avoid it? I would want that uh, whoever, uh, I mean, if the speakers can shed light on this question. Do you want to start with that, Peter? Thank you. Sorry, sorry, pardon me. Uh, the, the question was, um, is chat. this going to be uh, in the hands of a small number of people? I think the answer is almost certainly yes, because that's what happens uh, when any powerful new technology develops that starts centralizing. But, um, but, but, but 
that I mean, y- 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 yes and no. It, it, it'll, there'll be a, a small number of very large players, but an entire ecosystem built around that. That's what we have with classical computing at the moment, right? You have a handful of huge providers, but a massive ecosystem of smaller players providing services on top of it. Uh, it's hard to know how that will evolve, but inevitably it will be highly centralized. Right. So, uh, Dr. Fariad or Dr. Adam, uh, do you want to add something on this? Uh, yeah, if, if I may uh, go. So, I think this is a, a legitimate uh, concern uh, for many people, especially in the developing countries. Uh, but uh, in the long run, I think uh, it's not going to be the case because, uh, uh, first of all, uh, even if, uh, you know, a uh, few companies in many, you know, uh, in, in some countries uh, have uh, made their quantum computers, but uh, uh, this can be accessed by other people through cloud, just like, uh, you know, IBM's quantum computer can be accessed by anybody around the globe right now. So my personal hunch is this, that uh, in, in the very near future, uh, most of the quantum computer would be, you know, staying in the labs, of course, uh, staffed by uh, big companies, but uh, hopefully uh, most of the people around the globe would have access to them through cloud. And uh, uh, also as uh, this technology mature, I, I think uh, uh, that their, you know, implementation by many more companies and labs around the world would become, you know, uh, uh, easier as well. For example, if we take the superconducting quantum computer, so essentially we have a, a superconducting materials chip and people are working to optimize its design so that, you know, the noise can be minimized. But once it matures uh, uh, and uh, uh, the cryogenics and microwave technology that is required to assemble that, it's not that uh, far-fetched. And uh, I believe many hundreds of companies around the world uh, can, you know, uh, implement them uh, in, in future. So uh, I don't think that there's going to be uh, a big trouble in this regard. Of course, uh, the countries and communities who are already lacking uh, in technology, they will, of course, will have to rely on somebody else to, to access these computers. And because uh, very likely these quantum computers are not going to be something like a laptop that we have, you know, in front of us. They're almost, uh, you know, uh, for, for quite some time, they're going to stay in very, uh, uh, very highly technical labs and people would be accessing them uh, over the internet anyway. So the access will probably not be a major issue, uh, at least uh, that that's my point of view. Yeah, so for the example of IBM, um, if you work with them, they are very guarded about their superconducting quantum circuit technology. The specifics about how the chips are designed, how the qubits are designed, the interfaces, everything regarding the hardware. Um, you know, they're, they're very guarded about that. But um, things that are more like uh, algorithms, you know, um, uh, communication protocols, those are publicly published, you know, and um, so they're, they're kind of less guarded about that. Um, but th their interest is in protecting most about this circuit technology. Same with um, Google, you know, that's, the, the, we're talking about uh, political concerns. The concern in the US is that that technology to build quantum computers, um, you know, the specific knowledge, um, they don't want that going to other countries like China because um, indeed that's, that's what gives you the power of quantum computing. But uh, to, to agree with Professor Farhad, you know, um, uh, the, to make money, they're going to keep selling access to uh, their quantum computers via the cloud, right? So they make um, <clears throat> certain quantum computers available for free for anyone to access. But then if you want more power, um, better fidelity, uh, better quantum computers, then they have um, 
plans that people can subscribe to. Like they have a they have what's called the IBM Q network, and various universities and companies subscribe to that. And in some cases, you know, in many cases, they have these uh, hubs where they sell quantum computers um, to to uh, members of the hub that can use them. So. Um, as far as the, the power concentrated in the hands of a few companies, indeed, I, I think we are, I think I have to agree with Peter, we, we are heading towards that um, because it's simply where, that's where the big bucks will be made, you know, um, but surrounding that, there's gonna be um, lots of lots of opportunities and still lots of opportunities for, for students interested in in research in this direction. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mark. Uh, thank you, Dr. Peter, for giving answer to this uh, question. Okay, so uh, I guess it's time to wrap up this discussion session because uh, uh, we now have a short break afterwards. So I would now like to thank our guests for this informative discussion session and definitely our audience for asking uh, some of those amazing questions and uh, you know involving different topics uh, and bringing different topics to this discussion and obviously due to the time constraint we were not able to answer a few questions uh, but now as i mentioned that now we have a short break so the session will officially resume at 1800 pkt with a keynote talk by dr mark willey on quantum entanglement applications in communication and cryptography. So see you all then. We have a half an hour break right now. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.